Good evening and welcome to the seventh installment of the Adult Task Force webinar series. My name is Amethyst Johnson Creekay and I am the Manager of Information and Referral Services here at the Tourette Association of America. For those of you that are tuning in for the first time, allow me to give you a brief overview of the work that we do here at the TAA. Our mission is to better the lives of individuals affected by Tourette syndrome and tic disorders. The TAA works to raise awareness, advance research, and to provide ongoing support through our centers of excellence, chapters, and support groups nationwide. Tonight, in celebration of Women's History Month, I am joined by TAA Adult Task Force members, Jill Cohen and Jackie Noah, and they will be sharing their personal experiences as women living with Tourette syndrome. Jill was diagnosed with Tourette syndrome at age 48, and following her diagnosis, she wanted to learn as much as possible about her condition and utilize that knowledge to help others. For the last six years, Jill has been the co-administrator of Facebook's largest support group for adults with Tourette syndrome. Jackie has suffered from Tourette syndrome, OCD, and ADHD since age six, but was not properly diagnosed until age 22. She is currently a project manager for the LEND program at the University of Iowa, and she presents to schools about her, about her diagnoses to encourage the inclusion for all persons with disabilities. And before I turn it over to the presenters, I would just like to inform all of the viewers that we will be taking questions at the, we'll be answering questions at the end of the discussion. And during the discussion, feel free to submit your questions to that question section off to the bottom right, and we'll be sure to answer them during our Q&A section. Okay, so. We're going to start with our first topic, <clears throat> which will be social situations. So Jackie, please take it away. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I wish I could see you, but you're probably glad you can't see me right now. <laughs> Been a while. Um, our first uh, topic that we're going to talk about is meeting new people as a, as a person with Tourette's and as an adult, since we've lived with this pretty much all of our lives. Um, and I would just have to say that I, I typically try and give a disclaimer pretty uh, pretty quick off the bat, um, depending on the situation that I'm in. Um, like Amethyst said, I, I give talks at school sometimes and as well as at my work and presentations. And um, I had a child with special needs, so I do a lot of speaking about being a parent of a child with special needs. So if I'm there for that purpose or something other than Tourette's and people don't know necessarily that I have it. Um, it's kind of hard to hide it when I'm standing in front of them. So I'm kind of um, just, I just kind of want to get off the table and sometimes I feel like the elephant in the room. So I will work it in fairly quickly, you know, and say, I also have Tourette's syndrome. And sometimes I'll make a little joke, like, you know, I didn't want you to think I was stopped off at happy hour on the way. And I don't know why I feel like I need to <laughs> sometimes joke about it. I feel like I need a little levity or something. I don't want them to feel like it's a heavy, heavy issue for me. And then um, sometimes when I'm meeting new people in a social situation, I won't say anything unless I feel like I notice them looking at me kind of strangely or um, some, some people are forward or kind of rude and even say, why do you keep doing that? So that just kind of, uh, <laughs> brings it about um, and where I have to have to say that, but I'm not ashamed of it. So I've got that at least now going for me. <laughs> How about you, Jill? Well, um, for me, social situations, I, I'm the reverse of you. I'm very much an introvert and the ultimate wallflower. But uh, if it's a small gathering, which is my preference, usually the host or hostess will tell those that don't know that I do have Tourette's beforehand. So please don't be offended if I don't shake their hand or if I kind of jump or make a motion. I work in the health field as an office manager for my husband's chiropractic office. I tend to be very upfront because very often I'm taking a credit card and people and I'm shaking my head with my neck shift and people say, oh, my card didn't go through. and that's usually the opening for me to say, no, your card is fine. It's me. And I keep it light, but I let them know, you know, this is the deal. Let's get you taken care of off of me. But I'm not ashamed of it. I've done nothing wrong. 
this is just what it is and people have far worse and let's make it a blessing let's just live our lives yeah well said i unfortunately i didn't get to that point of uh that acceptance of myself till i was in my 40s probably um there was a lot of i did feel a lot of shame as a kid because i was just told to stop it and knock it off and um you know it was led to believe that i could stop it if i just really wanted to or that i was doing it for attention so so it took it took me a while to get there but i'm there now as far as um acceptance more and not being ashamed so the next is disclosing um our condition and really that really hasn't been an issue for me as far as like employment goes but i know we cover that um with a taa and also in my job at university because it is an issue for many people um my first my childhood dream was to be a hairdresser and i was able to follow that dream and um you know i got some jokes later on about oh people trust you with scissors by their ear haha and stuff which i'll get into those types of jokes later but um i loved it and had a great career and um and i was able to cut hair like i wanted but times when disclosing it um when i didn't i felt i had no need to or shouldn't have to um you're kind of forced to disclose it such as um I was in Yonkers, which is a department store here in Iowa. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's closed since. But every, you know, it was a really nice department store, and I was in there several years ago. And um, my son struggled a lot with special needs and was sick quite a bit, and um, kind of had high stress on my life. So that had brought my tics um, more exacerbated, you know, which happens with stress in life. We all know. And I was trying to purchase. Um, a gift for someone and I was looking at a scarf and I was ticking so much that the scarf like fell to the floor so I picked it up and then I jump a lot and it doesn't count if it like my feet don't leave the floor and oftentimes it doesn't count if it doesn't hurt you know depending on the tick so so yeah. one scarf goes down and pretty soon two or three go down and then I'm picking them up and the more I'm picking them up and the more I'm jumping the more that the scarves are kind of you know all frazzled up and i had a bag in my over my arm that i had purchased earlier in the mall and pretty soon i noticed a saleswoman looking at me weird and um i just kind of went to get out of there and i'm trying to pick up kind of the mess that i made and i did and i, I put them back and then i'm kind of walking to another part of the store and she's talking to another lady and they're both pointing at me and i can tell that they're getting ready to stick security onto me and um i do want to crawl through the hole but i i went to the lady and said you know i'm sorry but i have threats in her and you know you can look at my bag and i haven't stole anything and um they thought i had shoplifting because i was acting nervous so you know that would have been much better had i had a better shopping experience i didn't feel like I walked in there to have to disclose that I have Tourette's and then there are other times like at an airport when they tell you, if, you know, nowadays if you seem nervous you know or, or acting suspiciously or whatever which I thankfully haven't had issues with but I do know of other adults with Tourette's that have had been pulled into separate rooms to be interrogated because they can't help but say bomb and how about you? Jackie, if I could jump in there on two things. One, I was thrown out of a pet store, Kookaburras, a few years, a long time ago, because I was ticking and uh, acting strange. I was followed. I disclosed to the store manager that I had Tourette. She didn't know what it was. She was not buying it. But as far as traveling, there's a wonderful program called uh, TSA Cares. I flew up to New York a few years ago to visit my family because that's where I'm from. And you call the TSA before you fly and tell them, I have Tourette syndrome. I'm going to be fidgety. I can't, in my case, I can't be touched. I can't be boxed into a corner. And they have somebody greet you and you avoid the long lines. Wow. It makes people nervous. You go and it's for you and your companion. And that's incredible. And, you know, we were treated very well. We were taken to the private line. The security guards knew that I could not be patted down. And, 
we flew out of West Palm Beach Airport into LaGuardia and back from LaGuardia into West Palm. And we were treated so well. And as a matter of fact, I got through without trouble. My husband got stopped both times, once because he was carrying homeopathics and they didn't know what the pills were. And the second, because he was carrying his adjusting tool and they didn't know what it was. And I had to call it up on the phone. I got through without an issue. He had a problem on both ends. But TSA, it cares. It's a great, great program. Thank you. I had no idea. I'm, I, we just we just got back from a vacation four days ago, so that would have been nice to know. No, thank you. It's never too late to get that information. So hopefully that'll help those in our audience as well. The <clears throat> excuse me. The last one for this slide is establishing boundaries. And I spoke earlier about making jokes. And Jill and I on here earlier today were on the phone talking about you know the the how humor helps us and you know i feel like you know i have a wicked sense of humor and i frequently can joke about myself and for me it just kind of it it kind of helps and you have to have a good sense of humor but it took me until you know just five ten years ago before i started saying something to other people that would make fun of me as well like i think it was kind of open season because i would pick on my you know joke about myself but yet not for anybody, you know, I would never dream of making fun of someone for their disability or their or their size or or anything about them and especially something that they couldn't help or control. But, you know, um, that seems, it, it, you know, it's, it still seems kind of like fair game, even to friends and loved ones and they, and they don't mean to be hurtful. I know they don't, but um, it's just kind of a sensitive thing. So I've gotten a little bit better about <clears throat> boundaries saying, you know, I'll just say, do you know how much like these neck, you know, I, those neck ticks, you know, come at a high price, you know, or whatever. I mean, even though you're okay with it and I'm okay with it, doesn't mean they're harmless. And, um, you know, what, what are your thoughts about boundaries, Joe? Oh, I love boundaries. Uh, <laughs> I, I am the queen of boundaries. And it plays into my OCD. I cannot be backed up against the wall. So we've established a rhythm within our family that when we have social gatherings back in those days that we had them, I always had to have the end seat. And my husband had to be the one on my other side. So <clears throat> he's used to being ticked at and he's used to getting bruised. But <laughs> I have to be able to escape. And we had an incident once where I was at a restaurant, we were listening to somebody play music and I was backed up against the wall and I felt trapped. And I was ticking like crazy. And the guy actually came up to us and said, I made his wife nervous. And I just said, how the hell do you think I felt? So I like my boundaries. I like more personal space than the average person. I do tell people that if they invade the, if they invade it, I try to say nicely, please, I need more personal space. If they press it, I, I get real New York on them and say, look, man, I told you already. Because if people invade my boundaries too much and they've been warned, that simple little ha-ha 30-second moment for them can send me into a tailspin that could last two weeks. <laughs> so I establish my boundaries. I explain why. And I got to look out for me and for what does but i love my boundaries <laughs> that's that's good and to be proactive I, I hope to be better i used to always worry about hurting other people's feelings way way before and you know kind of to hell with my own feelings and just to want others to feel bad and um you know i found now i still don't want to hurt people's feelings but i kind of have realized i don't want to be hurt either and there's no reason that i should put up with that you know at, at my expense, you know, jokes at my at my expense when it when it does hurt. Okay, next slide if you could, Amethyst. So the obtaining a TS diagnosis as an adult. Um, so I wasn't diagnosed until I was 22. My my tick started when I was six years old. Like in my bio, started with <clears throat> clearing my throat and um, then blinking followed and stretching my neck and scrunching up my nose, you know, the bunny nose, which I still get, you know, oh, you got that cute little bunny nose going. And, you know, it's not cute when it lasts for years and years. And, you know, you can't stop doing it. But um, it, you know, followed down my body like 
the Tourette's trajectory normally kind of does with the shoulders and you know the head and the neck and the shoulders and the arms and and then into the legs and even toes and so I was you know starting to do all of these things and then my my parents asked me why I was why I was clearing my throat so much and I said I didn't know and you know did I have a sore throat no even though I did you know have a lot of tonsillitis and strep throat as a kid and all of that but but even at a young age I knew that I just had to do it something my mind was telling me to do it and I couldn't stop it so unfortunately um you know we were in a small town and I grew up on a farm my first uh shot at the doctor for you know trying to figure out what this was happened to be um perfect season for ragweed and um said oh I must have a ragweed allergy and they all thought oh that that's that's the deal okay and um it wasn't but I was just kind of glad that it, it kind of got people off my back for a while so to speak but um you know I just got in trouble for it you know so so healthcare professionals for me I've, I could have done double backflips out the out of the office the day that I found out that it was Tourette's, you know, and I was 22 and my mom had already passed away, you know, and, and I, I felt like I wish, you know, she would have known it wasn't her fault, like she thought, and it wasn't my fault, like we thought, but um, there is a, you know, a, a technical name to it. So I was actually thankful to get it so, because I thought I was, you know, like possessed okay. or something. Up Online. to that. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was just. I'm sorry, say, Jackie. Usually in the usually in uh, um, in the professional like healthcare professions or whatever, so many doctors I find are very good providers, but they just don't know much about Tourette's. At least in in Iowa here, where I am, um, I'm often their only patient if if they have any. And um, you know, I, I do, I've done my own research for thirty some years now, so you know, I turn out to be kind of the expert in the room, and they'll ask me what I've what I found recently, you know, do my own legwork. How about you, Jill? Well, uh, growing up in New York in the early 60s, uh, nobody knew what Tourette's was. So I had all these little habits, quote unquote. Yeah. And I didn't find out until, and I was always the weird kid in school and to be the weird kid in New York that, you know, that's a stretch. <laughs> right, right after I met my husband, uh, who, as I said, is a chiropractor, about six weeks into our relationship, he says, I have to tell you something. And I thought he was actually breaking up with me. And then he says, you have Tourette's. And then he actually pulled out a sheet of like 20 symptoms and I had 18. Mm -hmm. And I refused to accept it because growing up as a child, there was a woman with Tourette's in my neighborhood and she would come into my father's retail store and say, hi, Mr. So-and-so, and then she'd let off a stream of curses and then she'd say, here's your 27 cents. And I didn't know what it was, so that's what I related it to. I actually went into an emotional tailspin and I suffered from severe anxiety anyway. And I felt that I wasn't the person I was and it took about six to seven months for me to come out the other side and say, there's now an answer for what I, what I do. And you know, nothing has changed except those two words. And that's when I started learning and getting into advocacy and helping others. Because I had a tough road. And if I can make just one person's life easier, that has helped more with me with accepting my Tourette's, accepting my abilities, knowing that my abilities are only, my abilities are set by the limits I put on them. But I went into a total tailspin when I found that. It took me a good seven months to come out of it. You know, that's so interesting because we, we had talked about this earlier, Jill, you and I, and that, um, you know, it was a relief for me to get a diagnosis and it was hard for it set you back. And, you know, every individual is going to be completely different when, and just like the parents will be when they, if their child is diagnosed. And it's just like me being an, an extrovert, you being an introvert, you know, there's no two no one everyone's gonna have their unique journey but that's what i love about you know you and i collaborating on this is because almost opposite but yet you know the common core is that we have it and we've had it our whole life and we're going to have it probably the rest of our life so that's interesting you know my parents did did take me to the doctor and they tried and they, as they said you know later we just didn't know you know we just 
didn't know. And, and there's times, you know, you just weren't doing it, you know, not realizing that I was suppressing it, you know, at school and, and different things like that. But so they took me to a psychiatrist, you know, when I was around 14, which of course is about the time of puberty. And it was really rare in its ugly head. And uh, they never once mentioned OCD or Tourette's. And I was really, really riddled with rituals at the time. And um, they talked about epilepsy and seizures from what my parents described to them. And uh, I blame myself because I thought I was like really good in their office and I wasn't misbehaving, you know, I was, like, yeah, I was led to believe or whatever. So I thought I was just such a good actress, you know, that no ticks slipped out and, uh, you know, it was my fault. And the, this doctor actually said that he thought I had the world by the tail and didn't know what my problem was. And uh, which kind of reinforced that I could stop it if I wanted to. So anyway it's I'm, I'm thankful that when i started cutting hair it was a it was a client of mine who said you might want to try a psychiatrist i was looking for someone and um i had seen the phil donahue show and they were talking about ocd so i kind of self-diagnosed myself with ocd because some of the rituals they talked about about getting stuck on the stairs rang true and um one thing led to another and and i was diagnosed so um, then I started, you know, researching things on my own. Okay, Amethyst, next slide, please. So first, first dates or whatever, and just dating in general, thankfully it wasn't much of an issue for me in high school. Um, I dated the same guy for, for three or four years in high school and, um, my kids weren't nearly as noticeable in school as they are now. I, they've gotten worse as an adult and that's due to life stress that I'll, we'll talk about in a little bit and uh but i was you know riddled with uh, ocd and obsessions and they just ran rampant but my peers didn't notice as much um it was noticed much more at home because it would take me hours and hours to get ready for bed and get out the door because i had so much i had to do but jill i'll t uh, you know you know you can talk more about dating and and things well, when I was dating, I didn't know I had Tourette's. I just knew I had a lot of first dates that didn't go anywhere, and I never understood why, because I was dealing with this thing that, well, you know, you know, I've got a good sense of humor, I'm intelligent, and I never understood why I would have all these first dates, and they never went anywhere. Now, looking back, hindsight, it was the Tourette's, and had I known it could have been a lot easier yeah. but uh you know my i had already had my last first date by the time i was diagnosed but it definitely affected my my dating and my social life and it probably made me more of an introvert than i already was yeah Unfor yeah unfortunately it's you know threats threat itself is hard on the self-esteem sometimes and uh, those kind of interactions can can really you know make it more so unfortunately um the like the reaction it reminds me of michael wolf who who i'm friends with who who also has threats and he's um done a lot for the ta as well and he and i were talking at a national threats conference several years ago and he even included in like his his keynote speech speech later or whatever that he when he was dating who is is now wife polly and they've been together for decades but when they were first dating for quite a while and he got the similar talk that you did jill with your husband she's like we need to talk and he's like oh no you know you what wasn't sure and she he kind of leads up to it, and he's really funny too and eventually she said he said well i have Tourette's and something and uh, she says oh thank goodness i thought you were on drugs <laughs> and it's just interesting you know that and you can see why people think that you know and luckily they're able to you know joke about it too but but dating is a, is a different ballpark my advice to to younger people would be don't be ashamed of, i mean everybody's got something that's for sure and you know ours are just more visible th than others and um it has led me to have just a ton of compassion for other people and then you know when i had my son with disabilities i work with those with disabilities and i i've always felt different myself not I hadn't considered a disability because I didn't know what it was for a long time, but it is under the, you know, Disabilities Education Act and those types of things, the ADA. So um, for anybody listening, your kids are going to make it. They're going to they're be okay. It's, it's, you know, there's rough things about it, but 
it could be worse and they're going to be outstanding citizens and kind to other people and usually their siblings are as well okay amethyst probably the next one so pregnancy and motherhood um my you know um since i was 22 and was finally diagnosed or before i was diagnosed and um i really hadn't thought about family planning or how threats might affect it because i didn't know what it was exactly um when when our first born uh baby was born he was a boy um it was kind of on my radar to watch for it but not a ton and you know computers weren't like in every home you know kind of at, at that point or not a lot anyway like they are now so the more research i did on it the more i understood that you know um any offspring of a parent that has threats you know has a 50 50 chance so to um, have Tourette's as well and if they're male it may be even higher so I was concerned you know to a point he wasn't showing any signs of that at all his name is Jonah and he's 26 now but he had a lot of um, tonsillitis and some strep throats which I had as a child and if any of you have you know read about any links there's there's a condition called pandas and they might have taken out the N or the D now I can't remember but the long story short is there's you know some information out there it may be loose or not in, um, for streptococcus virus and uh, I had that all the time as a kid and I'm the only one in my family with dreads and I was the one that had you know this kind of problem so we went up there was some length but by that point if if there was you know it had already been done and it's irreversible what have you so when Jonah started having those types of things um, a lot of strep throats I thought wow <laughs> If I could have went back and had my tonsils out, you know, at age five or six or whatever, would I still have this? And um, anyway, so I talked to his pediatrician about that, and he hadn't heard of that um, before. But he said, if you can show me, you know, the data, then you know, I'll consider it because they didn't want to just take tonsils out for no reason. So I dug some up and presented it, and he agreed. And we had his tonsils out then, like when he was in first grade. And he doesn't have Tourette's. Um, and you know, as he got older, we would talk about it. And he's thankful I advocated and took those measures just in case. But at the same time, he's so sensitive and kind that he would never want me to think that he wouldn't want to be like me, so to speak. So, um, at, yeah. Jackie, again, being the other side of your coin, I had my tonsils at a two and a half. Really? Yeah, well, I had tonsillitis at two and a half. Well, and my first memory is actually coming home from the hospital uh, from having my tonsils out and being sick in the doorway of my parents apartment so i mean and you know it's again the other side of the coin no you're right and and it might blow my theory that it, it wouldn't make a bit of difference <laughs> in my life either i just wish i would have met you much earlier in my life jill and we didn't live across the country from each other <laughs> we could take our show on the road after this as far as medication during pregnancy um by that time when i was finally diagnosed i was on um i started um an ssri it was prozac at, at the time and it took a while to get to a therapeutic dose and i felt like like the scales had fallen off my eyes i felt like everything i did was for the first time ever in my life i played I, my first golf game was like oh wow this is this is great where i it had forced me to quit in my high school years um golf which i which i enjoyed because my rituals were so bad it would take me forever to swing the, the club you know because i had to line up my feet you know just right but um for, you know i'd ski down the mountain like oh this is great so the ssris really helped and i felt you know better than i than i ever had felt before i started reading books voraciously i never finished a book before because of my rampant you know add and blame myself so there was a lot of bonuses but when i was pregnant i was so happy to be having a child who's 27 when I was pregnant with my first son that being off medications really didn't didn't bother me much um what did bother me was you know I was still ticking I was so happy to be pregnant but um when I was cutting hair I hit my stomach a lot I have my whole whole adult life I still am and I'm 53 and I mean it's not a little tap it's a pounding in my gut and um I was given someone a perm back then you know, back in the days when people had permanent waves, 
we're all women here, right? And uh, so I had a, what's called a rat tail comb and it has a long skinny end on it and I hit my stomach so hard while I was pregnant with the rat tail comb that broke in half and snapped and flew across the room. And um, that's one of the few times where I've ever really been angry with, with God for my condition. <laughs> You know, and uh, I excused myself and went to the bathroom and, you know, I said, this hurts this child in here <laughs> and it didn't and he, and he was fine. But um, it, it's just, it's, you know, it's a different animal altogether. So um, pregnancy hormones weren't bad. Um, other hormones were, you know, in puberty and um, that kind of stuff, which will be on another slide. But um my fears as a parent, parent, you know, I covered with Joan, I was worried about. And then when Samuel was born with a, you know, life-threatening condition, um, it really think, put things into perspective that, yeah, Tret's, you know, is hard and may, you know, <laughs> kind of suck, you know, out in public at times, but, and, you know, and it's can be painful and everything. It's a lifelong thing, but um, compared to what Samuel had, it's, it's not terminal. So, you know, kind of put things in perspective. But um, adjusting to motherhood, and, and Jill, I'm, I apologize that we talked about this earlier as far as the motherhood piece, but um, just, you know, once I had my son with, uh, with special needs, they sent him home on hospice. He was a week overdue, and um, I, you know, I'm happy to say that he lived to be almost 12 years old, and he was nonverbal, and, and he couldn't walk or, or talk, and he was fed by a G-tube. Um, and he fought for life every day, but he was my pride and joy, you know, both my boys were, you know, and I'm, um, it, it, there's just a whole, whole lot to, to his care and it was 24 seven care. And, uh, so it naturally exacerbated my tics, my OCD, my rituals, anxiety. Um, I think we, as moms, if there's any moms in the audience out there, want everybody in the family to always be happy. And we take that on ourselves, you know, and, uh, when there's tension in the home that, you know, for whatever reason, then I think most of us will do anything to alleviate it and we tend to put ourselves on the back burner. And I joke that I don't even think I was on the stove during those days, let alone, you know, the back burner. Um, I think, you know, we can relate as a, as a mother, you know, um, I think people's biggest fear as, as a parent is losing a child. And, um, you know, I, what made it much harder, you know, was my intrusive thoughts led me to somehow believe that I had the power to keep Samuel alive. So my rituals were on fire for the whole 12 years. And so was my anxiety and, and my tics and, and not to be a victim. And I take it all back in a hot second if I could have him back, you know, after he passed away. But um, when I would go to any type of, uh, of uh, doctor, you know, to talk about Tourette's and like I said, I just didn't have much time for myself back then. So the once a year I might do that, they would say, well, you know, stress and lack of sleep exacerbate ticks, you know, and I said, well, that's my whole life is stress and lack of sleep, but we're just going to have to work around it because he's not going anywhere. It was, it was suggested that maybe he should go home. And I said, oh, he's got one and it's with me. So um, and that's why my ticks, I know, um, have gotten worse into adulthood. So I hope that the audience doesn't think, oh, wow, you know, you mean my daughters could get worse because that's not the normal trajectory either. I, you, you just never know. We, none of us know if we're, what to what degree, if any degree, we'll have it into adulthood. But, uh, you know, I want to give you hope, not not fear. But but it was all worth it to have him. So. And for the and I don't have any biological children. Uh, I became a parent uh, at the stage where the boys were in college and driving. But uh, I am, you know, I am into my pets and stuff. and. If you, for those of you that are young enough and you want to have kids or you're thinking of having kids, just love them. Just don't put any boundaries on them. Don't put any limits on them. Whether they have to, if they have Tourette's, be an example and show them, look how far I've come and I want you to go further. And just note, again, the only limits I have are the ones I put on myself. And don't let your fears go on to your children, whether they have Tourette's or not, because they can do anything. Yes, very, very well said. Yeah, I've yeah, got some words. 
Okay, next uh, slide, Amethyst, please. So I already spoke about you know some of the caregiving and loss, and there's just there's there's just no way to get around grieving other than to go through it. And it's been 11 years for me, and I finally found a really good counselor, and uh, it's made a huge difference. Um, you know, my <clears throat> having OCD as a kid, you know, I was always trying to keep all the balls in the air as far as performing every thought and every ritual and every prayer perfectly or else you know and like my or else was life or death and the you know the fear was always that something bad was going to happen to someone i love never to me you know i always said you know if it was me i'd be like okay fine take but if it was always someone i loved and um and when my mom was you know sick my ticks increased too it was like if I didn't do everything perfectly and someone I loved was going to die. That was the bottom line. So, um, you know, the the caregiver role, I'm sure there's other caregivers in the audience and it's it can be exhausting and it doesn't have to be a child. It could be a spouse or, you know, a parent or any type of loved one, but it's naturally going to cause stress, which causes anxiety, which causes ticks to get worse. And, you know, the, it's kind of a vicious cycle. Um, I you know, 11 years in after Samuel, and it's just come to my attention within the last few months that I'm still doing rituals in my head to keep my life and so on. And somehow I feel like if I don't do them, I'm going to have to lose them again. And I and have dreams, you know, of the same sort. So, you know, not to be more and we can move on from that. But if there's anyone that is dealing with any type of grief whatsoever, it can be grief from losing a pet, losing a job. You know, grief is is grief. It's the loss of a marriage or anything. Give yourself the grace that it's okay if, if yeah, you're I, increase. Uh, as I told Jackie, um, my service dog died suddenly two weeks ago. Uh, she was 13 or 14, maybe 15, we don't know. But she went from being greeting us at the door with a dish towel in her mouth on Friday to being dead at midnight on Wednesday. Uh, it was, and well, I have another dog and we're looking into getting a second dog and I have my two cats. I mean, this was the dog that saw me through my diagnosis. And wow. she, she helped me with my anxiety and she went oh. everywhere with me. And I'm just so her just spiral down. She had a tumor, an undiagnosed tumor, which is very common that burst and the diagnosis, it, it literally is a roller coaster down and the grief and today we got her ashes and the tick and she's been gone have just been so bad and the anxiety, but you know, it's one step foot in front of another, one breath at a time. And when her ashes were delivered, I couldn't even accept them. I went hiding in the other room and my husband did it. And we set up her little spot and it's just, you know, loss is loss. Yeah. And I, 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 I had a full blown attack when the vet told us what was going on. I, I screamed at this poor guy. I mean, <laughs> and I told him, how dare you? This is the dog that saved my life. That got me through my Tourette's and I'm not going to let you die. And I was screaming at him. And I mean, no vet wants to deliver that diagnosis that lady, I don't think your dog's going to live the night, which she didn't do. But uh, my ticks have been much worse the last two weeks. And I'm just trying to take it a moment at a time, give love to my other animals, support, yeah. accept, accept the support from my husband who is also going through the grieving process and in the right time, welcome another pet into our house. Yeah. But grief is grief. And no. the last two weeks have been horrendous. No, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you're, you're right. That's a perfect example. It just, we can't go through life and not experience hardships and, and loss and grief. And um, for those of us that wear our emotions very much on the outside, um, and as well as on the inside, which is often way more miserable than what we would lead anyone to believe it's, it's difficult. Okay, Amethyst, if you want to switch to the next slide. 
everybody's favorite menopause with ticks. <laughs> you want to laugh from those? I, I can't speak for hot flashes. Thankfully, I didn't have any, but I had massive, massive night sweats. But um, there is no doubt about they affect uh, hormones, affect, affect women with Tourette's, girls with Tourette's. You know, they kind of rear their ugly head in puberty and, um, you know, during every 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 period every cycle every month my entire life um it, it would increase my my ticks and uh, i didn't put it together for quite a while and uh, i never felt like i had pms necessarily where i was quote quote itchy but i would be way more anxious and my ticks would get worse um and that you know led to same thing with premenopausal and then um and then i have nine months of like almost constant flow two years ago and I was absolutely miserable, you know, with anxiety and, and hormonal and, and I like to say I didn't have mood swings, but I'm pretty sure my husband could argue otherwise. <laughs> but it led me to um, finding a good OBGYN and she truly listened. I just met her for the first time and I said, you know, this can all be all be together because some people, you know, I'm an OB, why are you talking to me about Tourette's or whatever? And I said, because it's, it all goes together, everything with us, one thing affects another, affects another, affects another thing. And um, I, I was, she truly listened and um, she could see how my body was in constant motion. And I was having a lot of breathing ticks and having trouble just spitting out words at the time. And, you know, my head ticks had been so bad. I call myself a human bottle head. So I couldn't even look her in the eye when I was trying to talk. So she could truly see and she said she would consider, you know, get, you know, in a hysterectomy, whatever, I had to biopsy and I ended up with a hysterectomy, it made a huge difference. I feel so much better. So there's a definite correlation there. How about you, Jill? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, the hot flashes, again, the opposite, the hot flashes were really yeah. bad and they went on for about three years. And living in South Florida, where it's hot and humid anyway, oh. uh, I mean, I, yeah. my husband would find me with the, again, with the, uh, freezer open and I do take a more, I take a very holistic approach to life, to my health care. So I took some homeopathic remedies that would help alleviate that. Sometimes I just resulted to taking a Tylenol or an ibuprofen because it felt like I had a fever. Uh, mood swings were the joke was I'd go from like slightly annoyed to angry. So they didn't sway that much. But uh, no, the ticks did greatly escalate during that time. And they subsided a bit, but they never got back to pre-menopause state. Yeah. Yeah, mine, mine uh, are still here, unfortunately, as well. And, and the anxiety, um, I was just kind of getting my footing and my grounding when uh, COVID hit. And, and uh, I've been working from home for a year and that's a whole nother story, which I'm sure everybody now just can relate to and brings on a, a new world of anxiety. But but Jill, I have to say here too, and any other, you know, the women in the audience that have experienced these things, you know, don't you love it how you go to get a pelvic exam or a mammogram, you know, or whatever, and uh, the person will say, okay, now hold still. Okay, now hold still. And I'm like, have you met me? You know, if I could hold still, <laughs> I'd be, you know, a completely different person, I suppose. But but I'm like, I'm trying to hold still. And the more, you know, they say that, forget about it. And as, as if any of those exams are so, you know, pleasurable to begin with, I'm not trying to draw it out anymore. But that's just another little joke that sometimes I have to say, I I, I can't hold, hold still. Everything has to feel right. Jill, I don't know if you're this way, but I mean, if I'm too hot, you know, my ticks are worse. If I'm too cold, they're worse. If I'm too cold, they're way, way worse. If I'm angry, they're worse. If, it, if my clothes are too tight, it, you know, they're worse. If it's too loud in the room, you know, that makes it worse. If it's too dark, I, it, it's all about feeling. It's like all the stars have to align before, you know, <laughs> I, I feel okay where, you know, my ticks aren't affected. Are you that way? Uh, sound and light greatly affect me. I. I cannot go anywhere without my earplugs. I walk around the house turning off lights. Um, if I could live in a house with just like a lighted TV screen, a lighted computer screen, a lighted Kindle, I'd really be okay. Um, 
there are some stores like Trader Joe's, they're so hyper with the sound and the lights and everything, I can't even go into because it's just, I become, I become like the Tasmanian devil. So I, I sit in the car and have to wait. Um, very, very, very sound. Yeah. Some of the, some of those, um, those lights, if they get kind of funky and, you know, they're about to go out and they turn into like almost a strobe light have been proven to like cause seizures in some people that have, you know, a seizure disorder. So they can be no joke for those of us who have neurodivergence, I guess. <laughs> um, so let's see, I just, uh, I wanted to interject this here because we're talking about women. There's an article that I mentioned to both of you, Amethyst and, um, and Jill, and for the audience, it's by Dr. Anthony Rustain, and he's actually on the medical board for, or has been for the Tretz Association. And it's it's particularly about how um, Tourette's in women is unique and different than, than the rest of the population. And it really resonated with me because it, it he points out, this is a quote from him, that uh, he believes that the social burden of Tourette's is particularly heavy for women. And as he said, because they're not supposed to be in any way socially unacceptable. They have to look good. They have to act right. They have to be perfect in many ways. You know, we have to, we're supposed to be a lady. We're supposed to be graceful. We're supposed to look good at all times. Therefore, making faces, jerking, making sounds aren't ladylike. And it's just something I never really thought about before, but I would have to say, I kind of, I kind of agree with that. Not that I'm a bigger victim than a man is, but I just hadn't thought about the different types of things. But that leads into to not realizing when young girls oftentimes aren't um, diagnosed as readily because they're not looking for it. And um, they say that's kind of been in the study as well, um, <clears throat> where autism and ADHD and Tourette's tend to be four times more likely in males and females. And then um, as, as Carol Matthews um, from the University of Florida has, has pointed out, if you're not looking for ticks, you miss them. If you're not looking for OCD, it may not, you know, you're not looking for OCD to occur if you're not looking, you know, for the other things and the comorbids, you know, if you're not looking for anxiety and you're not looking for mood disorders in, in girls necessarily. So it can get missed and, you know, they often keep those things and the anxiety on the inside. And um, she just points out that diagnosis rates may be especially low in girls and women because clinicians just aren't used to looking for it. Um, and then there's another clinician, Barbara Coffey, who states from the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine, and she says that the university's um, ticks and OCD related problems is what she heads up at. And she said she's seen the opposite in some of her female patients. And she says that certainly some of her very most severely afflicted middle aged patients with Tourette's have been women. So, you know, I don't, I don't, that doesn't bring me joy by any means that so many of us are suffering like that, but it does help me to feel like I'm less alone because getting worse as an adult is not what they consider typical, but there's a lot of us that have, you know, a lot of us as adults that still have that. That's why we started this whole webinar and the adult, you know, task force that, that Jill and I are on. Um, and anyway, I just, I just want to interject those thoughts. How about you, Jill? I mean, does that kind of give you a little bit of. I, I, I personally think, that the minority is the people that outgrow it, uh, you know. And we, why, why do we have two thousand members in our adult group, and we're not the only one out there? Why are there groups devoted to just women, just men, religious groups, all adults with Tourette's, you know? And it is harder, you know. A, a man can curse or be have these motions. And he's just being a guy, but like Jackie said, oh, she's unladylike, and it eliminate it reduces your chances for employment, it reduces your chances for dating, for a social life, for being accepted, because she's acting like a guy, and that goes into what society deems women should be, and you know, it it it's hard. I mean, I've gone into places 
we were sitting at a food court once and I was surrounded by people and I ticked and I threw my thumb right through the glass of uh, soft drink. And all of a sudden we had like 72 ounces of Diet Coke on the floor, most of it on me. No. You no. know, it looked okay. differently than if it was a guy who did it. Yeah, <laughs> no, you're right. Actually, you're right. I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, and then we're labeled, you know, a bitch or something, you know, for, you know, ticky or, or, or speak out because, you know, our anxiety is through the roof, you know, where a guy's just stand up for himself sometimes. Oh, the okay. anxiety, she's just, it's that time of month. That's why she's, it's anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> Can't say that anymore about me. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Muppets, do you want to go to the next one? I just don't want to run out of time if, um, at the time for the importance of self-care. So I, I just wrote exercise. I've taught, I've taught exercise classes for 24 years. Um, exercise has always helped me uh, a lot with my tics and I make jokes about that, you know, and stuff. I've taught aerobics and weight training and everything. And I said, I've been jumping for 45 years. So now I just get paid for it. Um, so I, reading, I love reading. During COVID, we took up puzzles. My husband and I love puzzles and gardening, massages. Um, church always calms me down as my, you know, Zen place kind of devotionals and good old fashioned naps. So those, those are things that I never used to have time to take time for, you know, when I was a full-time mom, but, but um, that helps me, helps me now. How about you, Jill? Yeah, and I recently, over the last nine months, I've lost 51 pounds. Holy and cow. I, yeah, uh, and my husband, just by osmosis, has lost over 40 which also helps with the pain in the joints and everything because, yeah. you know, my body's taking such a beating. Uh, like you reading, I read about a book a week. Uh, I'm into crafting needlework. I've started taking up knitting. My animals, they're, they bring a great sense of joy oh, wow. spending time with my husband. And yeah. just saying it's okay. It's okay to take this time. Yeah. I need I need this time. I need this half hour, this 45 minutes. It's okay. Yep. And allowing yourself that. You're right. Perfect, perfect segue to, to end on that. You're right. It is okay. And uh, I'm finally realizing that myself. So is there questions? I don't know when we have to stop Amethyst, but I just don't want to, for the webinar to kick us out <laughs> by itself. <laughs> Are you there, Amethyst? I hope. <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry about that, guys. I was having a little technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, but, um, we do have um, two questions here, actually. Hold on, I'm just trying to pull them up so that I can tell them to you. Okay, this first one comes from Chloe Winston. And she writes, how should we handle family that makes jokes that they don't view as hurtful? Often my family makes, oh, makes jokes with about my coprolalia, which makes me feel uncomfortable when, when I bring it up. They tell me that they have the right to make these jokes because my tics make them uncomfortable. Okay. Me, 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 me. I want this one. Um, <laughs> The dog that just the dog that just fought, we lost two weeks ago was my service dog, and I would take her all over, especially in the beginning of my diagnosis. And I had a family member say to me, "I could not bring her to their house because they do not allow dogs." So I looked them in the eye and I said, "Stop taking Lipitor." And I was just shooting something out there. I didn't know the person was on Lipitor. Well, I can't do that. Why? Because I need that to be well. I said, exactly. I need her to be well. As far as telling them not to tick, just tell them, stop breathing, stop blinking. You can't. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to be my support system. I think, so, yeah, I think that's what I would point out too, is like, you know, I think I would just honestly, and, you know, in a, in a quiet, what moment say don't you guys realize 
that I would do anything to not have to do this. I don't choose to do this. And outside of my home, I have to fight constantly to suppress this so I don't draw negative attention to myself. And it causes me so much grief when I'm around other people and in the public that home should be my safe space. Um, and, and say to them, can, can you imagine if you if this were you and, and you went to grandma's funeral and had to swear, can you imagine if you couldn't sit through a movie? It's not, it's, we're not a punchline. Right. And, you know, to try and get them to put themselves in your shoes, um, because it's not, it's not okay. You know, if, if, if the roles were reversed, you know, you could say, I would never say that to you guys, knowing how hard it is on me, you know, so I hope Chloe, I really, really hope you can look me up. Amethyst can give you my, my, my email because I'm here for you, girl. Me too. I once had a lawyer make a joke about it at a seminar and in the middle of like 500 people. And I wrote him a letter and I said, just your luck. He made a Tourette's joke and sitting on the third row, seventh row end with somebody with Tourette's and I just dislocated my collarbone when that happened. I wrote this guy a scathing letter and wound up with a giant bouquet of flowers. Whoa. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. So don't be afraid to speak up, be respectful, speak up. If you need help, come to us, come to the groups. We're here for you. You're not alone. You've got your community. Yes. And what was the other question, the name of this? Yeah, I was going to say that leads into the next question. Nora D asks, what is the name of that independent Facebook group that you're the co-admin of? Only adults with Tourette's. Okay, and everyone, that is again on Facebook. Okay, it's so on Facebook. Only adults with Tourette's answer the questions, and it'd be my pleasure to let you in. Thank you. Oh, and um, there's one last one. Um, Sharon H asks, what is the benefit of getting diagnosed with Tourette's as an adult, if any? Uh, for for me, I just I, like I said, it was just the relief to take to give to take the burden off of myself thinking I could really help it if I went like it was a choice in my life, like, like I was doing it for attention. So for me, it was the relief to know. And, you know, I, I wanted to run back to my hometown and put a sign in everyone's face saying, told you, couldn't help it. Told you it wasn't my fault. Told you. you know. So sometimes I suppose not everyone would, but you know, and it opens up the door for other things. If you need accommodations in employment, if you have a diagnosis, you know, none of us like want to run right out and get a, you know, a disorder or whatever, but yet you can get supports um, and, you, you know, utilize those supports, you, you know, through the Americans with Disabilities Act, you can have accommodations at work within reason, you can have different types. So there are some advantages to, to being able Absolutely. to put a name what to she it. Said. What she said, 100% what Jackie said. Okay, and then we have one last Just one again. This one is from um, Noah D. Um, do you find yourself, because of your tics, do you find yourself maybe sleeping more often than you might think an average person would or does? If maybe you compare yourself to your partner or whomever. I do now, only, but it's by choice because, you know, I can I could take, take naps now. Most of my life, I, I couldn't, but I, I sleep well. I have bad dreams, which I think, are kind of driven by some medication, but taking naps helps me kind of rewire. And uh, so it's not sleeping more in a bad way. How about you, Jill? I don't sleep more. I am prone to nightmares. That could be the panic and anxiety, but I am always tired. I am I know like always, always exhausted. Yeah. And yeah, my body's exhausted, but I'm, you know, my friends and family call me the Energizer Bunny. I, you know, I like, break my Fitbit because I like <laughs> have too many like steps on there or whatever. But um so my body's tired but 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 I'm not but I do know I have had periods in my life where I've been on medications, Noah, that may you know have made me dog tired. Like I was on Respiridol and ORAP and a few things several years ago and I could not get out of the head fog. So if it's something like that, um that's a whole nother story. And then you would 
you know, you want to talk to your provider and, and say, you know, I'm tired all the time, I can't function properly. But but if it's not that and you're just, you know, there's no shame in that. And we we expend a lot of calories during the day. <laughs> Those of us have tried, so that may be why too. <laughs> you're tired. Okay, and that's all we have for now. And for anyone, if we didn't get to your question tonight, please feel free to email me. My email is support at Tourette.org. Again, that's S-U-P-P-O-R-T at Tourette. It's T-O-U-R-E-T-T-E dot org. And I'll be sure to send your questions over the presenters, over to the presenters, and we'll get back to you. So thank you, ladies, for your time tonight. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in. Thank you, Have everyone. Really appreciate it. Spread the word. Okay, thank okay. you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.